figure out how to say Trump Loyal the right way. Does anybody know how to pronounce it? Trump Loyal. Okay, thank you. Anybody know what that means? Yes. Okay, what does it mean? Thank you. Thank you. Something looks or what it's not. Right. It's French. And it's called. It's French for fool's the eye. And so when you're doing full finishing, the whole trick is to fool the eye. So you don't want to spend a lot of time on stuff that's not going to fool the eye. Just big impressions to fool somebody. And so I'm going to go over how to do rust, how to do uh, dry brushing, tea staining, some air brushing, all kinds of stuff. So let's get into it. Wood graining is a cool thing to do. This was a casket that was uh, one of those little coolers that you see. And I had them laying around and I wanted to have something in the graveyard that looked like upturned graves. And I didn't want to build it because I'm not a woodworker. And anyone been at Home Depot and saw one of these things and wondered, does it really work? You know, <laughs> that's how this works. Well, it does. What it does is you lay it up to your wood and you do this like rocking technique and it leaves it behind. So I want to show you how that looks. I wonder, can you hear me if I just talk this way? No. Is there a here? Or should I talk in the microphone? In the microphone. All right. Okay, so when you do wood graining, the first thing you want to do is decide on what color do I want my wood. So for old caskets, I was trying to decide, all right, what color wood would it be? Because you can do whatever color you want. If you want to do purple wood, you can do purple wood, whatever you want to do. This one, I walked around my house and I'm thinking, old graves, old graves, what would old caskets look like? And looking at all the kind of wood graining that I had, I found this plaque, and I'm like, that looks like old wood. So I stared at it, and I'm like, what is the base color of this? And it looks like kind of like this muddy kind of wood color. And so what you do is you go to like Home Depot or something like that, or mix up the paint yourself, and find that base color. So I painted this the base color of the wood that I saw in here. And after you let that dry, you're then going to make a glaze. And this is the glaze. You can get it at Home Depot. And basically what this is, think of it like clear paint. And you're adding in a little bit of your paint. And oh, wait, before I do that, hold on. I made recipes. So let me pass this out to you guys. Yeah, there you go. You're going to take four parts of this glaze to one part of paint and mix it up. And then what you do is you paint on your wood lines like this. So I'm going to show you, like, you paint your wood, and you want to get some nice lines in there. So you take a nice rough brush that's going to leave some striations. And that glaze, because remember I was saying it was like clear paint, it's going to leave these nice striations like you see in wood, a little bit of lines and you let that dry. And then you're going to make your glaze, same paint, one part of your paint to four parts of the glaze, and then add some black to it, because now you want it darker. You want the grains to show. And so you're going to repaint your wood again. And then take this guy, and you rock it back and forth, nice and slow. Can you see that? You get a wood grain. Now, you can rock it fast, you get a wood grain like that, you can rock it slow, and you'll get more of like a, a straight oak look. So barely, whoops, let me get it right away, barely rock it, and you get a longer one. So I'm going to pass this around with the brush, and just if you want to like redo your palette, you can go like that, and then try it out. And let me, I forgot to mention, when you do the striations with the first glaze, make that a little darker than the base color. So you got your base color, you got your first glaze, it's in a little bit darker tone. 
and then you do your third glaze, that's in a much darker tone. Then, when I was looking at this casket, it just looked like planks of wood, like big, solid pieces. And so I was thinking, well, I need to separate it out. Part of wood painting is, remember this, black paint equals space. You want to have a plank, use flat black paint, and just draw a line, and you now have a plank. So flat black is space. So I add that in. Okay, so that is wood graining. What questions do I have about wood graining? That anybody has. <laughs> so you're going to have to get used to me. When I ask a question, I wait because it takes a while for somebody to come up with a question. So you're going to have to. Do you that drag? Do you go through to lengthen the wood grain? Do you drag or do you just roll? You can drag. Do, you can totally drag to lengthen it and then you go up like that and you get the knot in there. Right. It's really a lot of fun. Okay, rusty steel. Anyone want to guess what this is made out of? Steel. Fire foam. Yes, this is this is pink foam and me just going completely crazy with monster mud one day. <laughs> I wanted to make this look like cast iron, very old, and... <laughs> and I also wanted to make a steel box, and this is a cardboard box, nice. using the full paint. The trick, again, is monster mud. Oh, I love monster mud. What's monster mud, Tara? What's monster mud? Wait a minute, I'm looking for a sample of all kinds of mud. Here it is, okay. All right, you tell me what monster mud is. Joint compound. Right. Go for it. Joint compound with latex paint mixed in. Exactly. Joint compound, and here's a picture of the joint compound that I'm talking about. And I like these three pounders. I used to get the, what, 500 pounder buckets? <laughs> that was hilarious watching me at the Home Depot thing trying to lift that into the car. It was ridiculous. So now I get these little guys. But, there's all kinds of ratios for Monster Mud. I mean, I want to hear what people's favorite ratios are. Mine is five to one. What's everybody else's favorite ratios? I always use like uh, pancake batter consistency. Pancake batter? Okay, yep. Uh, that is this one here that I use. And the pancake batter one is good for base coats, I've learned. Um, I have a pancake batter. That would be three to one. So that's uh, one jar of this to 15 ounces of paint. And it's all flexible. You can go in between that, you can go more, you can go less. But remember, the less paint you have, the less flexibility. Because the paint is what gives the monster mud the flexibility. And so more paint, more flexibility. Now, is it waterproof or not? I, I want to know the answer to this. If you add enough paint, it is waterproof. It is, okay. So like if well, it's, I would say waterproof no. water resistant. Mm -hmm. water, okay. water resistant, not waterproof. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think you're right because like, see this uh, this hedgehog thingy that I have down here? You may have saw when you're getting cool lunch. That's using my favorite five to one, which is not very weather resistant. But I think if you don't rub it, it won't come off. Because it was on the. Uh, uh, it'll absorb moisture unless you paint with an outside paint. Okay. Like an oil base. So then this one probably absorbed it and then dried and absorbed it and dried it. Right. All right. So going back to full painting rusty steel. What I did is I made this cheat board for myself because I'm always forgetting what my recipes are for things like that and also what palette I have to choose from. And so for this cardboard box, this one was a little bit different, so I'm going to stick on the cardboard box. I painted a base of red monster mud, and this is the pancake kind of texture. This is a three to one. And I use a, a, like a rubber glove and I kind of just pop it on so I get some texture and let that dry. It looks like this. And then the next step is I use my black, which is over here. And how I do that, it's 
start talking this way. <laughs> Like here's an example of my rust, and what I do, what I do for the black is you have this wet because you want to have your sea sponge flexible. And squeeze out the water as much as you can. And you look at your sea sponge and go, what pattern do I like? Like down here is a real feathery kind of look. Over here it's kind of chunky. I'm going to go kind of... I think feathery will look kind of cool. And you kind of dip it in there like that. And you just pop it on the spaces. And what the sea sponge does is it allows peaks and valleys, just like rust does. So you kind of pop it in. And don't go like completely around. You want to add some variety to it, some kind of different textures. here, you'll see I have like sections of lighter rust in, in different areas. So you want to have variation. Okay, so I did the black now. Assume that was black. I only want to bring one monster mud out here. Then you let that dry and then you take silver paint. And the silver paint I like is at Home Depot. They have like Ralph Lauren. They're, they're kind of their fancy silver stuff for their houses and stuff like that. Get a gallon of that, it'll last you forever. And what you do is you dry brush. And you dip, how you dry brush is you dip a paint, you dip your brush in paint, and you dry it up really good on a paper towel, and then you just kind of rust it like this. And so now you're getting a silver finish. So we did a base color. We did black monster mud, dry brush silver, and now you're going to come back in and you're going to start adding some textures and some colors to give it some depth and texture. And so now we're going to go in with the medium rust, which is this color here, sea sponge it. And then in little light sections, you're going to do light rust and sea sponge that. Notice though you don't go as heavy with the light rust. This is an eye attention getter, so you just need a little bit here and there. Okay. Now for different effects, like on this box, I wanted to add some like mud on the bottom. So I got a mud color monster mud and I popped it on the bottom. And then for green slime, green slime is really fun. You take a popsicle stick and you just kind of bat it on and then drop it down and it oozes down like slime. And then you do the same thing with bird droppings. And I use a popsicle stick. And then the magic step. Let me get that ready. There's my black paint. Okay, I was talking about dry brushing. I actually want to demonstrate it to you. Dip it in. And dry brushing is exactly what you think it is. It's a dry brush. So you have to really dry it off. Who does dry brushing now? Isn't it awesome? Yes. It adds age to everything. The secret to dry brushing is that it will highlight raised areas. Let's remember my wet side so I don't get it all over the place. This is what's going to give the rust that depth and realism. You're going to start going across it like this. And you see how it all of a sudden now is getting that rusty look to it. So let's do it back here. Over here. And then the only thing that stops you is yourself because I'll keep going. You know, it's like you could rub it in and make like a smoke spot. And that's dry brushing. So of all the tips that I'm going to show you, dry brushing is, is really valuable. You can do it with silver like I did it. I've done it with white, and I'll show you on this tombstone here. It's a great technique. I'm going to pass this around so you can see that. I've got recipes on there for the ones that I've remembered. <laughs> Whenever I mix these monster muds together, I sometimes just do it on the fly. But a little tip with monster mud. When you get your sample paint at Home Depot and you mix it in with your drywall mud, it always lightens up. 
which sucks. So you have to kind of bring it back to where you want it to be. And so you get artist paints. The difference between artist paints and what you get at Home Depot is pigment. You get a lot more pigment in artist paint, and so you don't start screwing up your 3 to 1 or 5 to 1 ratio. You can add little teaspoons and tablespoons of these. Like uh, this one is a brown. This is what I use for mud. It's called burnt umber. It's a great paint. And then raw sienna is almost a natural rust all by itself, so that's a good one. <laughs> I also wanted to mention, has anyone heard of tea staining before? Yes. All right, let's get around. Okay, tea staining is like really watered down paint. You can also tea stain anything, like if you wanted to do this rusty eye beam and make it a little bit more like rain had eroded, do the same thing using a rust paint. And you use this raw sienna for the tea staining step. And I'll show you, I'll actually tea stain this tombstone so you can see exactly what I mean by tea staining. Final thing on rusting is called glossing. Glossing is you take, this is called high gloss varnish, it's an artist thing. It's just very high gloss clear paint. And you use this to add life to something. So anything that needs to have like a live look to it, wet, or what do you think on this box I want to gloss? Exactly. So what you do is you take this and you pop it on and it's going to have a nice wet color and it's going to dry exactly like that. Anything else you think I should gloss? Yeah, there we go. On the Hellhound? Oh yes, like uh, the eyes on. Uh, anyone see the Hellhound they did a while ago? Okay. Cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, his entire mouth is glossed up. His nose is glossed up. I even did his tear ducts. Anything where moisture would be. Now another thing I like to do with this kind of stuff. Here, I'll do it with this. Stand back. Go like that. Or maybe like a big sticky spot, that kind of stuff. This is great stuff. This is glossy. Okay. 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 What questions do I have on monster mod or rusting? And I'm gonna wait. What's the cost on the, the paint itself, the one for the fourth the artist artist paint. Paint. Great question. This stuff's cheap. <laughs> this stuff, it's called Basics. You can get it at Hobby Lobby. You can get it at Michael's. I'm thinking maybe 10 bucks for a jar. I don't remember exactly. But it lasts a really long time. They also sell them in tubes. But what I like about it, this is, you know how they have foofy, fancy artists? Well, we don't need that for Halloween. We just wanted to, you know, make some quick and dirty props. And so they came out with this basic line. It's good stuff. So it's about 10 bucks a jar, if I'm remembering correctly. And it does last a long time. What other questions? How'd you make the bulbs on the ivy? <laughs> oh, these guys, okay. Yeah. By almost losing all my fingers on my jigsaw is how I made the bolts on the high beams. <laughs> I was like, okay, I want to cut these little hexagonal little things. And so with my two little fingers, oh, it was a bandsaw. I'm like this, ting, ting, cut it up while it's running. And that's, that's how I made that. And then I cut a wooden dowel into slivers and then glued that on the top of that. So. You could just use a knife and do, do it out of the uh, pink bones. Well, it was a pink bone, and I was trying it with the knife, and it kept swooshing. So I was trying to get this cleaner cut, and then I thought, well, I'll do a, like a tube of it at the same time. I was trying all kinds of stuff. There's, there's a ton of better ways. I actually found a better way. I did uh, haunt panels. Has anyone seen the video where I did these giant haunt panels for the front of the garage? Yes. Okay. Well, that was a pain in the butt, doing those bolts. So went to Home Depot, and 
how many people go to Home Depot and, and just stare at stuff trying to ID, you know? So I'm thinking, okay, there's got to be an easier way to make bolts. So can anybody guess what item that I use at Home Depot that I just simply just stuck on it with pretty much like bolts, and they weren't bolts? PVC ink caps. Ooh, that's a good idea. No, it wasn't that. If you saw the video, you know. I got a hundred in a bag for like five bucks. Tile spacers. Oh, yeah. right. It was so cool. I was looking at the tiles and I'm like, they look like Hector Dunham's thing. So I just stuck them out there and voila, I was out of there. Yeah. No, these were round and had the X in the middle. Yeah, I know, they're cool. <laughs> My YouTube channel? Yeah. On the notes, you see in the right hand corner, I oh, have okay. on there uh, my YouTube channel, Scary Lady Videos. I couldn't come up with the name, that's the best thing I came up with, was Scary Lady Videos. This is before Tara even came to be. So. Okay, so Fool the Eye, this was my favorite. What's this look like? Bullet holes, rivets. Ribbits. Yeah. Exactly. They could be whatever you want. A bullet hole would have more of a like a rougher edge, but these were for rivets. And this is all done with airbrushing. This is completely an illusion. And how you do that? I have here step one, step two, step three. Step one, if you have an airbrush, oh, let me do it this way. If you have an airbrush. And you can also do this with a hand brush, with a really light hand. But say you had an airbrush, you do a white circle, a fuzzy white circle at the bottom. Then you do a fuzzy black circle at the top. Okay, so you got fuzzy white, fuzzy black. Then you got your stencil with a bullet hole that could be the shape of, or just a eye had a ribbon. And you put it right over the center, and you do white. Keep your stencil in place and do a fuzzy black inside the stencil at the bottom. Keep it in place. Do a fuzzy white at the top. And I think I wrote that down in the notes so you don't have to like kind of try to keep up with that. And that's how you end up with rivets. And you can do bullet holes and that kind of stuff. This is great to finish off any kind of rusting technique that you have. Now, I'm always looking for airbrushing folk techniques. Anybody got one to share? that they've done with their airbrush? Mostly just airbrush makeup. Airbrush makeup? Like shading? Yeah. yeah. Okay, like I just learned about shading. With an airbrush, it's awesome because, who has an airbrush? What? Okay, not many. So you may want to consider an airbrush because of the shading. The natural technique of an airbrush is it's heavy in the center and kind of flushes out. Perfect for shading. And so anytime you want to shade a prop to make it look deeper is what you do is you imagine where the light source is. Like say the light source is coming from here to here. And just imagine if it was 3D, where would the shading be? It would be at the bottom on the opposite side. And you keep doing that and pretty soon you're going to get the illusion of like a plain wall or something like that. Same philosophy going on with these rivets. If you look at it, the light source is coming from the top. And so it's highlighting the top of the rivet and the bottom of the dent. And then you have the black for the opposite side. All right, so I'm going to pass this around so you can take a look at it. Acetone. I love acetone. Now, who hates acetone? <laughs> have, have you done it on pink foam and had disastrous results? With that? <laughs> oh, oh, you actually had to use it for what it's intended? Yeah. That happens. <laughs> acetone, if you want to add a full look to tombstones, don't be afraid of acetone. Acetone is what's in spray paint. 
and uh, it, people say don't ever spray paint a tombstone because it'll dissolve the foam, which is really true. It does in really cool ways if you control it. What I like to do now, what I used to do with acetone is I used to just use a big brush. Now I got this rounded, I don't know, pointy thing. And I dip it in acetone. And every one of your pink foam, like foam boards, always has faults or something like that in it. Because I learned with this new lavender pink foam, which sucks by the way, is I like the pink better because it reacted better to acetone with this lavender. You find a fault and you touch it with acetone, just like that, and it'll start dissolving. I didn't want to bring it here today. And you go around and find all your faults. So you'll start to learn to like the faults in your foam because it'll start dissolving in a beautiful way. If you go to an area where there's no faults, it just kind of sits on there for a while, unless you kind of go like this, and then you can hit it with the acetone. So I wanted to show you what you, what you can do with acetone once that dries and make it more realistic. If you look here, I had done a hole right here. So let's find a hole on this side. And see how that looks neat, kind of OK, but not really that realistic. So what I like to do, I have this pottery tool. One has a pokey karate, and the other side is just like this flange or something like that. I like to go in and just kind of start poking away at it and dig it around, and it starts looking like uh, centuries-old damage to a tombstone or something like that. Like here, I'm noticing with the lavender, you get the skin on it. You can just take that off. And you start getting more and more crevices and holes and, you know. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, it won't heal, no. <laughs> but I like to dig on it. Then, let's see, oh, here's another one. Let's dig on that one. And then I like to take a wire brush and imagine, you know, like acid rain. Over the centuries, the pollution will start eating away at stone. So think about it like that and say, let's bring it down a little bit. And let's bring my pokey prodi, kind of help it along. Scratch it down. And you start getting a bit more of a realistic look to it. Do some more here. Kind of help it along. And kind of be, you know, kind of free. And <laughs> just say, like, look, this is how it's going to end up. Scratch it. And then brush it. The sides are good to do that for. I did like a big gouging area. Really poked it up. And a little bit more lines there. Okay. So this is what I do to prep the tombstones to give it a centuries old look. Okay, so I'm going to pass that around. I'm starting to really warm up to 
the beady foam. I call the white the beady yeah. foam. I think it looks so much older, the tombstones. You have to work hard at the pink to get it to have a worn, old look to it. Whereas the beanie foam, Actually, you don't have Mongo to do did one for me last year on the white foam. Mm -hmm. Did you do one yesterday or last year with the white foam? Yeah. Carved it, and I'll bring it in and have you guys look at it. It looks really uh, much older, looking like the uh, like the 1800 style. Uh, so and I never finished it out. Yeah, and I'm also hearing that if you use a hot wire tool, that you can get more detailed cuts with the BB foam with a hot wire. When you start using other tools, they kind of just start flying off and all the Acetone, do not use acetone. Yeah, yeah, don't use acetone with the white foam. I, I, would, I would totally just use that brush and just... This is not <laughs> okay, with tombstones, you're looking at the very first tombstone I ever made, which completely sucks, and I'm embarrassed to even show it to you, <laughs> which is why it's cut in half now. <laughs> I've evolved a lot in my tombstone building. That is um, the sexiest tombstone ever. Oh, really? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that what sucks to you is that it's half She crazy, man. Oh. <laughs> Well, let me tell you my new technique for doing tombstones. The last two that I did, I was I was really happy with the result. Uh, if you've seen my videos before, you probably have seen the old way, and this is the new way. Let's assume, because I didn't want to repaint a whole other tombstone. Oh, there's the white beetle. Let's assume that we just coated this with dry lock. Now, who can tell me the three awesome things about dry lock? Number one. It comes in a can, no! <laughs> it's water-based, water okay? And what else does it do? Water it waterproofs! Yes, I love it! What else? Uh, it gives it a harder surface. Gives it what? Harder surface. It, a much harder surface, and it has something in it. Grit and texture. Obviously, not a lot of people have used dry lock yet. If you haven't, Buy a quart size, buy a little one and give it a shot. Because you can also have it gray. So it does three things for me all in one stop. It paints the tombstone gray. It makes it waterproof. And it gives it a gritty texture. And it's tintable. And it's what? You can tint it with any other latex paint. You can. You can tint like like a Lowe's. Your tombstones aren't the same color. Yeah, Lowe's doesn't carry the gray. Or no, no, Home Depot doesn't carry the gray. Lowe's does. So if you're stuck at Home Depot, you can ask them to tint it, and they'll tint it great for you, or like an off gray brown to change it. Yes, yes. It says right on the can it can be tinted. So if the guy goes, he can't tint it because they don't want to work at mixing it. Right? And, and I tint it a lot of times off that hoop paint and mix a little, just do one off and mix it with the, the hoop paint. Oh, okay, yeah. Myself to get different colors. Exactly. I actually might just buy a five-gallon bucket. Well, we don't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's assume that this has all been dry locked and it's, and it's dry. Now I'm going to do accent painting. If you've looked at ancient stones, you see a lot of lichens on there. And am I saying that right? Lichen? Okay, lichen. Lichen is kind of a rusty color. So I'm going to dry brush just a couple of pops on here. Because what you need when you're looking at a solid gray tombstone is it's boring. You need to add some color to it, some interest. And so I popped in a little bit of this lichen color. And now I want to add some green, mossy kind of color to it. And this is my ugly green, glossy color. And that's made out of chromium oxide green, or green, <laughs> chromium yellow, or yellow. <laughs> And 
burnt umber, which is the brown. I love burnt umber. It's like such a natural color. <laughs> so I'm going to do the same thing, but more in a blotchy kind of thing. So I'm going to kind of put a couple of blotches. Now you're probably thinking, wow, that's like really vivid, but wait.
of a stone wall. By the way, these rocks are made out of foam, too. <laughs> How'd you make the rocks? I chunked it, like like breaking ice. Just toing, toing, toing. You see that? Oh, yeah, it really out the rock. Not the best job, this is a pretty wet brush, but generally we dry brush this. Okay, so how many steps of tea stain have we done already? Zero. How many steps of tea staining before the dry brushing did we do? Zero. Well, you did two. I had you pretend. That's why you don't remember. So, so we had done two tea staining, and then we did dry brushing. Now we're gonna do real tea staining, and this is gonna make a mess. Let me move all this. Of all the questions I get, it's usually the tea staining. It's hard for people to imagine what I'm doing. So remember I showed you I put about a chunk of black into this water and mix it up. And I always like to try a hidden spot first to see how bad it is. Yeah, no, pretty good. Okay, this is going to be a, a dark one. I just pull. Start at the top and let, let weather like rain, if it was raining, let it drop down naturally. So I'm going to get away from the microphone and just tea stain this. See how it just goes where it wants to go? together and you gotta let it dry and that way your your rivers of paint will find new paths if it's wet it just keeps finding the same path over and over again now this is black and what I'll do is I'll probably pretty much do this whole thing let's assume I did this whole thing it's empty and then you sop up the stuff that's on the bottom your brush and put it back in and then you do it again <laughs> and you do it over and over again until it's all gone. But I want to add in a little bit more color variation. This is still kind of boring. So I'm going to add a possible stick. Okay, I'm going to add in a little raw sienna because I want to have this now a little bit brown. Tea staining, but I think the floor's worth it. And 
that wasn't too messy. Now normally I'd have this whole water on there. Okay, I tried an experiment. You tell me if it worked. Don't feel bad if you say it doesn't. But this was my new attempt at white lichen. Oh, that's pretty good. It does? Oh, okay. Let me tell you how I did it. <laughs> I just tried this yesterday. I was like, I don't know. Um, when when you're full painting stuff, it's what you gotta do is see if you can find the real thing and just stare at it like kind of a zombie and go, all right, white lichen. And so I found some white lichen on a tree I had and I was staring at it. Uh, all right, it looks kind of flaky. It's got let's see, white, cream, dark green, some black. And then I went inside the prop room and said, what can I replicate that with? This one I used a, to a tissue paper and I dipped it in white paint, but I think next time I'm gonna use cornflakes. Because I think it's gonna give me a better texture. But what I did for this is I did tissue paper in, in the white, let that dry, and then came in with my favorite sponge. This guy. And I sponged on the what? The cream the dark green, the black, and I started getting a texture that I liked. So there's a way to do like it. Oh, and the little pops of orange, that's actually on a tree. I was noticing a little pop of orange, so I, I made a little bit of orange in there. Okay. I like it to like it. Okay, good. <laughs> Just 
this is called a full function power square. It's pretty cool. I like it.
colors. So this is a great recipe book for that. This is another version, which is it has the same colors on both sides. So say you had this artist palette of these colors. If I mix this color with this color, I get this color. If I mix this color with this color, I get this color. So it's another cheat on how you can mix your colors. Uh, a what? Gradient chart. Yeah, gradient chart, exactly. And you'll see, I don't know if you've realized this yet, but some colors, when you add to other colors, they turn to mud. <laughs> so this helps you avoid that. And then I like to make my own sheets. You know, when you take red and yellow and blue, you have the full color circle, but what are the colors in between? And so I made these little sheets where I blended them, and it's like a palette that I can refer to. And this one, I like cadmium red, and I also like azalea and crimson, so I could look at, if I just change the red, what different colors I get. So it shows me the palette. I made that for a bunch of stuff. All right. Okay, well, that is what I have to talk about with faux finishing. Anybody has some questions that they can ask or some good ideas they have? Well, kind of off subject, but I was just curious that uh, devil dog that you did, the uh, demon yes. dog, how long did it take you to do that? Okay, my hell, yeah, the hellhound? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I made a hellhound, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, I decided I wonder if I could carve. Um, so I bought a truck full of pink styrofoam. $226 worth, and I glued it all together, and so I had this giant block of pink foam. I know you're all jealous, right? It was like it was like paradise looking at all that pink foam. Okay, well, try to screw up the courage to cut it. <laughs> so my first cut, I went in oh so gingerly, you know, and you could barely tell what I laid off because I was so nervous. So finally, I had to dive into it, and I had a toy model, and I carved out. It ended up working, <laughs> and I carved out this demon dog. Unfortunately, when I got done with him, he looked like a giant naked cat, and I had to add some scales to him, and I don't know why, but I could not figure out the logic that God has with scales. They look simple. I couldn't figure out how to replicate it. How, he, how on a snake, how you get that beautiful uh, sheen to it, and it, it's uniform, but it grows bigger and smaller. So I wasted a month of time with scales. All the pink foam, I cut it in a thousand ways. All together, it took me about two and a half months to make the demon dog. But uh, he's done now, and uh, he's getting ready to go out in the front of the yard, and I'm going to be out there with my shotgun if anybody just tries to kill him. What's your address? Yeah. Shotgun. 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 Okay, what time did you go first? I'll be right after. <laughs> She's got to reload sometime, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. What other questions or other people's faux ideas? Or okay, how do you keep the shop so clean? I clean it up every time. I cannot think in a mess. Like right now, this is I'm starting to get jittery. <laughs> Her OCD is kicking in. I'm constantly cleaning. I can't think. In a I didn't see a shop. dust bunny. Yeah. No. Yep. Yeah. It's it's. I clean about three times during a session. I just. Yeah. So Unlike Pickle, it, it he is cleans three times in a lifetime. What? Unlike Pickle, he cleans his shop three times in a lifetime. How do you find anything? He knows. He has to go to the water. Hollers up his kids. His boots get first off. I know exactly yeah. where yeah. every piece of tool is in my garage. Every piece of tool. Mine's hanging all on my wall. You should see yes. my property. I got my pipe board everywhere. Usually when I already need something, he stubbed his toe on that's where it is. Did you talk right. about the uh, PVC pipe that you run up? Oh, yeah. Um, you know how you know lovely Kansas winds? <laughs> yeah, it's a blast. So uh, this was my cure for that. I, I read it on the forums. What they were doing is they were literally, uh, somebody would get a big like drill bit and then drill through there and put the PVC. Well, I like one and a half inch thick foam. And if you take two pieces, you got a three inch wide tombstone, which I think is a good width for a tombstone. And so what I do is I take the two halves and I put PVC on the inside of it and glue it all together. And then rebar is in the ground and I just slide this over and, and no problem after that with blend. It stays there. You may have also noticed the two little holes at the bottom of the plywood. I use tree stakes and twine and I tie them off on both sides and it's buried in the grass and you can't see it. 
and neither can the burglars. So if they were going to try to steal it, yes, well, the, so he we, does the same thing. So he puts the TVC in there. Exactly. And then you, they you sandwich it together and it holds it in. It's just right for half inch PVC. It's awesome. It's a great invention. Okay. What other questions? Or any of from my videos you had a question or something like that? I kind of got a lot of videos now. I just keep <laughs> making more. <laughs> what was it you said you put on the board uh, to install the lid? Oh, oh. You know how I was talking about the wonders of dry lock? Well, sometimes you don't want that grit. And uh, another forum member had mentioned, hey, Tracy, did you ever hear of Glenn Gripper? And I hadn't, and, and uh, she had used it for her, something she didn't want to have to grit. It's like the most super duper primer you've ever seen. It has no grit, and so I lid and gripper this whole thing, and it just holds this beads in. It fills in really nice. So if you if you want like a dry lock waterproofy kind of thing, but no sand, lid and gripper. And I've just discovered it's an awesome glue for pink foam. White foam. I'm hearing some people having trouble with, but for pink foam, it's a good glue for doing the tombstones together. And it's cheap. You can get it at Home Depot. I do that for, I call that detail shading. 
same thing for like the cracks. You come in with the flat black and do the crack, a really thin line, and it makes the crack look even deeper and forever in there. Okay, good. Do you use the hot wire foam to cut your, you know, the, like hot foam factory and wire yeah. cutter? Is that what you use? I just I just started using that. Um, they actually contacted me because they saw my hell horse that I made last year and says, you know, you'd have a lot easier time if you use the hot wire. And so I started using it. Um, it is great for epitaphs. They're engraver. Really fast work. I mean, I just went right in. And then I was also able to literally in like carve. I carved this dead bird using it. Uh, I also have their industrial hot knife. Now that I use like crazy on the hell hound because that was good for sculpting. When I was cutting out my tombstone, I didn't care for it very much when you're cutting straight cuts, because if you just move just a little bit and using that long hot knife, you get an angle cut, and then they don't match up. I like the jigsaw, it's a nice 90 degree straight. So you just use a jigsaw? I use a jigsaw when I cut it out, but I do use the hot wire when I want to kind of shape, because it's a little bit more weak. So, but I like the flexibility. Good question. All righty, well, I'm out of your hair. <laughs> Thank you.